Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proof. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morata. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Hey, everybody, welcome back. And as you all know, I'm a big U2 fan. So tonight, U2 will have a chance to continue its winning streak and you also have its unprecedented, undefeated streak shattered because they are facing U2. Yep, that's right. Tonight, it's U2 versus U2. Songs of Experience versus Songs of Innocence. These are the most recent U2 albums. And. When you're going to talk about U2, you have to get judges from at U2.com. So we have Brian Betteridge and, of course, Dr. Chris Endrenal, who has been on the show before discussing U2 and has done a previous time hosting, wearing the uh, tuxedo T-shirt. And then, as always, we have the wonderful and extraordinary Dr. Tim Furnish, who's a fan of U2 as well. So lots of brain power, lots of U2 love for this U2 on U2 fight. Ringside, we have fellow album fight producer Michael LaPerry sitting there, so we'll wave at him. He also is a multi-time tuxedo t-shirt wearing judge. So Mike, how are you doing out there in the crowd? Big fan of U2. Looking forward to seeing if U2 can take down U2. Great. Mike loves album fights so much. He just likes to sit in on the fights like ringside. So I'm going to give him a <laughs> shout out. He actually helps me produce these now. So it's neat to have him over here. So now let's go to Richard for his pre-fight analysis. Richard. Hey, everybody. Richard here. Good to be back with another album fight. And this is an interesting one. U2 versus U2. Songs of Innocence versus Songs of Experience. Kind of a deep cut fight. These aren't the albums you'd normally think of, but... We have experts that literally wrote the book on U2, so I'm sure they've got a lot to add to this. So I'm not going to provide a whole lot of kind of personal analysis. We're just going to look straight at the numbers. We did 13 categories for this fight. Of those, Innocence took four of them. Experience took five. And there were four ties. So what does that tell me? Well, it tells me that either one of these albums could just kind of win in a landslide, or it could end up very close and it could end up in a split vote. So it really depends on the people analyzing this and the people scoring this, kind of where it's going to go. If my gut had to tell me something, I would say that they're probably going to lean towards experience and experience is going to win this. Personal, personally, I think in his, I prefer Innocence to the two albums. I like its kind of fun take on the 80s, but I think experience is going to take this probably somewhere in the lines of Eight rounds to five would be my guess. Anyway, that's predictions for this week. This is going to be a fascinating listen, and we'll be back with you guys at the end for the uh, post-fight breakdown. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. All right. Yeah, so it's interesting when he puts the numbers together. We'll see if it holds true on his prediction about U2 beating U2. Now let's go to Phil and have him do the ringside introduction. Phil. Phil. This week's album fight is a 13-round matchup of recent songs from a legendary band from Dublin, Ireland, U2. In the red red corner, corner. with an album album that was distributed distributed for free to 500 500 million people, people. we have have U2's 13th 13th studio studio album album from 2014, 2014, Songs of of Innocence. Innocence. And their their opponent opponent in the the blue blue corner. corner. With a collection collection of letters letters penned by Bono, Bono, we have U2's 14th studio album album from 2017, 2017, Songs Songs of Experience. Experience. Let's get get ready ready to to ramble. ramble. Take it away, judges. Perfect. Thank you so much, Phil. Well, I guess we may as well get started. Anything pre-fight from you, Brian? Any comments as we get ready to start this fight? I really am excited to see how this is going to go. Uh, I like both albums quite a lot. Uh, I really liked Songs of Innocence when it first came out. And when Songs of Experience first came out, uh, I was a little cool on it. And I liked them about equally. And I was really kind of surprised to see what my final score was when I went through this. 
Well, we'll get to all of that stuff in a moment. How about you, Dr. Andrew? How was your experience with this fight? Well, you know, this fight's kind of a natural comparison, right? Because songs of experience, songs of innocence, the, the similarity in titles. So I was really excited to pit them track by track. I, too, loved Songs of Innocence when it first came out. And I love, love, love Songs of Experience when it first came out. And um, it was interesting to see how Songs of Innocence held up over time with Songs of Experience being newer. So it'll be fun. All right. And Tim, how about your pre-fight? Any thoughts? Well, I, this is strange. I mean, I don't think I've done an album fight one group. I mean, a group against itself. I think we've always done different ones when I've been on, Pete. This is what, the fifth time I think I've been on or something like that. And U2, since the Beatles is my favorite band, so I was a bit torn on this. I'm like, oh, no, U2 will win, but U2 will lose. <laughs> but since it was the last, the last two albums that the group did, it's, it, it's a bit of a challenge. So, yeah, looking forward to it. Let's go ahead and let's let our newest judge, Brian, start us off in round one. <laughs> The Miracle of Joey Ramone versus Love is All We Have Left. Brian? Okay, so the big determination for me in comparing these two songs was that I really feel as though The Miracle of Joey Ramone, while it's a really great song, it's just a straightforward rock and roll song. And at this point now, or at least at the time that this album came out, this was the fourth straightforward rock and roll song. We had Elevation and then uh, Vertigo. Get On Your Boots and The Miracle of Joey Ramone. And out of those four, The Miracle of Joey Ramone is at best the third best of those four. So it's something that they've done over and over again. And while I, I like to listen to it and I like to hear it live, it just got a little boring. Whereas Love Is All We Have Left, that was the clear winner to me because it's something that they've not really done before. I think Bono called it the sci-fi Sinatra when the album came out. Uh, it's got better lyrics. I really love the two lines. This is no time not to be alive it is great and nothing to stop this being the best day ever are, you know, all time great Bono lyrics. The Miracle of Joey Ramone doesn't have that sort of thing. Even though objectively, I think Love is All We Have Left is a little bit of an underwhelming song. It's also something that they've never done before, which makes it the winner because the miracle of Joey Ramone, is, it's just a rehash. So, And I really enjoyed comparing them both as also concert openers because Joey Ramone opened the Innocence and Experience Tour and Love Is All We Have Left opened the Experience and Innocence Tour. I also enjoyed the Love Is All We Have Left as a better show opener. So that also gave it a little bit of an edge. So uh, just overall, that's that's the better song. Yeah, it's an excellent nit to pick and I appreciate you doing that. Dr. Chris. Well, these albums could not have started more differently from my perspective. I love, love, love The Miracle. I always have, and I think I always will. It resonates with me musically, lyrically, and thematically. I think it's a great album opener, and it's a great show opener, you know, with, with the big OOOs. I mean, it instantly connects with an audience, and it draws your attention in from the second you press play. And I personally could not have more disdain for autotune. I hate, hate, hate auto-tune and i just don't like love is all we have left i know that i'm in the minority i do appreciate what brian said about the lyrics i think the lyrics in love is all we have left is awesome but there has to be better ways to achieve a similar or better effect than with auto-tune so perhaps i would have found it more effective as an album closer and pit it against a song that i really like in the miracle there was no contest for me songs of innocence wins this opening round 10-9 fair enough and tim how did you have the first round all right, Miracle of Joey Ramone versus Love is All We Have Left. I mean, I like both these songs. I think they're both really good starts to their respective albums. I really like the fuzzy guitar on Miracle of Joey Ramone, and something that we probably say a lot here, and I'm sure I won't be the only one to say it, is one of the things I really like about U2 is how the edge comes up with different guitar sounds for different songs, different albums. And sometimes within the same song, he comes up with different guitar sounds, which I just think is amazing. I really like the backing vocals on Joey Ramone, but I really like Love Is All We Have Left also. It's sort of Sinatra-esque, and it's almost apocalyptic way, in a way, in a quiet sort of way, but I did wind up giving this to Joey Ramone 10 to 9. Perfect. Let's go on to round two. Every Breaking Wave versus Lights of Home. Chris, why don't you start us off with this round? Sure thing. My round two comparison kind of sets the tone for a common theme throughout this fight. I really like both of these songs, so this was kind of a tough round to judge. Um, Every Breaking Wave is its kind of a perfect piece of pop music, right? But that, that's kind of my issue with it. I think it's too perfect. There's an edge to the character of Lights of Home that's not present in Every Breaking Wave, and it's that quote-unquote less than perfect nature of Lights of Home, and that appeals to me. Every Breaking Wave seems a little too polished, a little too smooth, like it, it, it plays it too cool. And I think it costs Songs of Innocence here. Lights of Home musically is extraordinary. 
what they do with the sense of meter, I think, is amazing. So this one goes to Songs of Experience for me, 10-9. Well, if the PhD is going to talk about amazing and throw out some technical terms, you have to give <laughs> us a 30-second primer on what the hell you're talking about. Last summer, I wrote a little piece for At U2 that used Lights of Home, and I talked about how U2 manipulates a listener's sense of meter. So a sense of where's the strong beat and where's the weak beat. And in Lights of Home, the band kind of plays with that. And that's tied directly to the lyrics. So it's, it's musically interesting to me, which, which is what give lights, gives Lights of Home the edge. No, thanks for that explanation. I know that'll help all of us uh, scoring at home. Let's go ahead and have Tim go next. Tim, how's your round two? Round two, Lights of Home against Every Breaking Wave. Again, two really good songs. Not a whole lot of drop-off from the first, uh, if any drop-off from the first song in each respective album. Again, Lights of Home. It's sort of inspiration light, which I know that a lot of the critics accuse you two of that being sort of their uh, their go-to mode, right. which of course, you know, Bono. Bono, as I was going to say about another song, but basically, you know, Bono likes to throw in Christian references, but not too many. Uh, he doesn't want to alienate people, I guess. And, and this song is interesting, Lights at Home. It sounds like something I've heard before. From the first time I'd heard it, it sounds like something I'd heard before, which is kind of familiar. I really like the lyrics, but they are sort of... You know, uh, almost too you 2 a free yourself to be yourself, that verse, that stanza, a chorus, I should say. If only you would see yourself and then repeat ad infinitum, some might say ad nauseum. Uh, every Breaking Wave, great bass line opens it up. One of the best lines I've ever heard from Bono, it's hard to listen while you preach, which, you know, sometimes he does seem to make fun of himself. Yeah. But, but I gave this one, to, I, I wound up giving this to Every Breaking Wave 10 to 9. All right, perfect. Thanks, Tim. Brian, round two. Okay, so I'm going to preface this with two things. First, I'm a live U2 guy. Uh, that's what I do for at U2. I work on all our, our tours informations. And as far as I'm concerned, U2 is at their best when they are performing live. And I will also say that this was the first of two tracks where I, my initial thought was, hey, this could be a tie and I needed something to break it. So I went to live performances for as a way to kind of judge the impact of this song that, that the song had on me. I, I chose Every Breaking Wave over Lights of Home. I mean, Lights of Home is fantastic. And to be honest, I actually prefer the, the bonus track St. Peter Strings version over yes. the, the album version on there. But I ended up going with Every Breaking Wave because the solo piano version that Bono and the Edge played on the Innocence Experience tour and also on some of their promotional tours was to me so fantastic that it really brought out the lyrics of the song, the basic music of the song. I don't typically like when U2 strips their music down like that. And I thought that this was one of the only times that stripping their song down to the basics made it a better song than it was on the album and a better song than it would have been if they played it live or as a full band, I should say. Uh, And to me, that just demonstrated that it's a higher quality song it's a better constructed song and it's the song that if if you were to say to me hey you two will play one more song tonight in concert and you can pick every breaking wave or lights of home because of that version i would pick every breaking wave and so i voted for that song 10 to 9 i like your nitpicking man that's good that's perfect all right let's go ahead and go into round three california there is no into love versus you're the best thing about me dr tim kick us off well, California, I, I, was this because it was the special mix I listened to or not? But I don't remember the album having starting out with church bells or whatever those bells were, but that's that was on the version I listened to on Amazon Music. The backing vocals, again, really good. Of course, it's Beach Boy-esque, which is not exactly a key revelation in terms of analysis on my part, but there it is. I thought the lyric, uh, Then We All Fell Into The Sea, which is rather appropriate for what's going on on Gavin Newsom's watch, but I don't want to wax too political here. You're the best thing about me. Here we go again with with Bono, excuse me, with The Edge, with, with, with even a different guitar sound, again, as I alluded to earlier. You know, it's a great love song. The bass part is great. I like the drums. The lyrics are interesting. Again, they're not the best thing U2's ever done, but I do think this song is better than California, so I gave it to You're the Best Thing About Me, 10 to 9. Great. Brian, you're round three. I think both of these songs are really evenly matched in that they are kind of cliche airy pop songs which U2 does a lot of and they they do it well when they do it and I always enjoy it but the reason that I went with You're the Best Thing About Me was uh, it just felt catchier to me and it was the one that when I heard it for the first time stuck in my head the longest and I also have to say I don't usually 
sing along to songs in the car or anywhere like that. It's, even if it's you two and, they, and it's my favorite song in the world, I don't usually sing along to it. However, and you're the best thing about me when Bono gets to the line, I'm shooting off my mouth. That's another great thing about me. Mm-hmm. I absolutely adore that line and I will sing it every time it comes on. Uh, I, I don't know what it is about it. It's just jives and it, it catches with me. So, and I really enjoyed, I didn't, I haven't been able to hear California. There is no one to love live in concert. And I think I heard you're the best thing about me a couple of times and the acoustic version, which unlike every breaking wave was not better than the full band version on the album, but it's that catchiness. And there's that little guitar break in the middle that the edge does maybe more toward the end, right before he gets to the, I can, I can see, yeah, I can see you love her loudly when she needs you quietly or whatever that is, where they get to this really cool new guitar it's a new guitar sound. It's a new kind of thing that they haven't done before. And that also kind of put it over the edge. So that was a 10 to 9 victory for me for you're the best thing about me. And Dr. Chris, what about you? Yeah, you know, I, I talked about uh, perfect pieces of pop in the previous round with Every Breaking Wave and Lights of Home. And we have another one here in round three. You're the best thing about me is, to my ears, is songs of experiences, Every Breaking Wave. But it's not quite as on the nose as Every Breaking Wave is to me. When Bono's lyrics present the question, why am I walking away? That allows for a lot of interpretive leeway. And I love that about Bono's songwriting. When his songwriting is not on the nose, when it, when it allows you to interpret it from several different perspectives, that gets my juices flowing. And you know it, that for me distinguishes You're the Best Thing About Me from the perfect popness of Every Breaking Wave. California is a fine song. I do love the lyrics of the chorus, There Is No End to Love. I sing along with it every time I'm in the car or every time it comes on a shuffle. But California is never a song that I seek out. It's it's never one that I'm that I'm like, you know what I haven't heard in a while? California. But you're the best thing about me has been on my playlist since Songs of Experience came out. Like that it, it like like Brian said, it's so catchy that it easily wins this round for me. I just want to take a quick time out and ask Chris. You, know, you said it was a little on the nose, California, there is no end to love. And Dr. Tim also noted the on the noseness of the Beach Boys aspect, which it's inspired by. So yeah. it, can you describe how they get a little less on the nose with that song? Because I think we all kind of felt the same thing. In general, the judges did not care for the song with only one of the CompuBox judges going that direction. The subject of it is about the first time the band went to California, right? So it's 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 very straightforward. It's it's about you know the the blood orange sunset, right? And it's about the feeling of California because there is no other place in the world like California. And from you know when four teenagers from Dublin, where it's gray and rainy half of the year, go to California for the first time, it's going to be a revelation. But lyrically, for me, it doesn't really stray from that, and that's totally fine for a song to do. But You're the Best Thing About Me is a pop song, but it's a love song. But what exactly is he singing about? Because you can interpret that, you know, it's about Allie or it's about some other friend or it can be about different things. California is about California, period. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Let's keep moving. Round four. Song for Someone versus Get Out of Your Own Way. And we're going to have Chris start us off. All right. Get Out of Your Own Way connected with me instantly. I even uh, went back in my Facebook feed and looked at it from 2007 because I remember I posted about it when YouTube was releasing different tracks from Songs of Experience leading up to its December release date. And I talked about the song's beautiful day-esque quality and how the song's message kind of sucker punched me. I established a, a personal connection with Get Out of Your Own Way instantly and bono has mentioned that it's a song you know that he he would sing to his daughters and i have i have daughters and i have a son and it's exactly what i sing to them every night you know it's your fight i will help you but it's your fight but that's not to say that i don't have a personal connection with song for someone because i do if you recall the band put out a call for fans to submit videos of them singing song for someone so i i i sang that song to my to my son for months, for months and months and months. But for me, the universality and the contemporary message of Get Out of Your Own Way helps it take the round. So I give it 10-9, Songs of Experience. Fair enough. Brian? So I like Song for Someone. I think it's a, it's like a perfect U2 song, but it always kind of bugged me a little bit that it seemed a little too perfectly constructed and a little too perfectly u 2 uh, for lack of a better term. But get out of your own way, really, like like Chris said, I, I, Chris said two things that I really liked. First, he said that it struck him immediately, which is certainly true for me. The first time I heard it, I was just like, wow, this is incredible. But it all, I'd also, 
agree with what he said about it having a certain uh, beautiful day sort of feel to it. And Beautiful Day is a fantastic song. So anything that's reminiscent of that is, is going to be really good for me. But it also is just like You're the Best Thing About Me. It's very catchy. And I find myself kind of really following along with the melody of it, and especially the chorus. It's a great chorus. And it's part of like that one, two, three punch in the middle of the album where they just have three really catchy songs, one after the other on Songs of Experience that uh, I get really excited when I get to that part of the album. And Get, a, get Out of Your Own Way is kind of like the centerpiece of that passage of music on Songs of Experience. So for that reason, I voted for that one 10 to 9. 10 to 9. And Tim? The Song for Someone is a lovely acoustic piece. You know, it's plantative. It's hopeful. Uh, I really like one of the best lines, again, in this one, in any U2 song for me as a Christian, is it's a long way from here to Calvary. I, I re- really like that line. Again, I like the fact that Bono and The Edge will talk about the Christianity, but they don't beat you over the head with it. I appreciate that. I think the vocals are exquisite. But get out of your own way. I do wind up giving this to get out of your own way 10 to 9, although I really tried hard not to. And that's because of that stupid, over-the-top political video. I mean, I, I don't Bono really believes his Trump bashing stuff or if he thinks he just feel, he, he feels like he has to do that. I don't know. It's kind of annoying. I mean, but what's really good about the song is, as you guys have pointed out, it's a really catchy tune. It is a good song. I have never heard a song. And, and, and I give kudos to people when they come up with terms that I've never heard before. Amorist. A-M-O-R-I-S-D. Okay. Got to give kudos to Bono for coming up for that. Uh, for that I've never heard that before. I love it. Vocals are really good. And, and, you know, I have two teenage sons. I can help you, but it's your fight, your fight. Uh, you know, so I, I appreciate that. And, you know, if Bono just wouldn't hit me over the head with the political stuff, I would have liked it better. But I still gave it to this one, I, uh, 10 to 9. All right. Well, let's move on into round five. Iris Hold Me Close versus American Soul. Brian, start us off. Okay, this is another round where I used the live experience of hearing both of these songs in the past couple of years to kind of help sway my decision. I love Iris. It's a great song. The lines at the end about Iris playing on the sand is is some of, are some of Bono's best lyrics and his most personal lyrics and just really well done. However, American Soul, when you see that live, there's it's. I think the way I descri- described it to my, one of my friends at the time was it's U2's most stomping stomper of a live song. The big American flag that they had up behind them was fantastic, and you just like I felt it in my chest it, the, every time that they like hit every drum that Larry hit, every bass note, you just kind of feel it hit you. Uh, and it, it made that song so much better. Uh, I also like um, Kendrick Kamar's bit in the beginning. I think it's a really nice combination. A nice, it, it really complements the song a, a lot. So for that reason, I went with American Soul 10 to 9. Fantastic. Tim? These are probably my least two favorite songs on these respective albums. I know I'm supposed to like Iris because it's Bono singing about his departed mother who died when he was 14. But it sounds to me like something off How to Dismantle an Atomic Bomb, which I think, which is one of my least favorite U2 albums. So I'm just not particularly fond of it. I, again, I appreciate that he's opening up a bit with the lyrics, which is not something U2 is known for doing. And it's a decent song. American Soul. See, I'm just, <laughs> I'm the opposite of what you just said. I do not like that sort of like contrived rap beginning. It's like you two, dude, you're my age, okay? Me, Bono and I are the same age. If you're pulling in a rapper to rap at the beginning of the song, you're just trying too hard, okay? That's just not you, all right? I just didn't like it that much. The bass line's great. The guitar line's great. But I think American Soul is basically you two going, oh, look, we haven't written a rocker in a while. Let's write a rocker and see how everybody likes it. This doesn't connect me that well. and I, So I didn't really like either of these songs very much, but I gave it to Iris 10 to 9. Sounds good. Chris, does it connect with you? Yeah, it did, actually. I first heard this song. I was in Graz, Austria when this song dropped on iTunes. I was, I was over there presenting a paper at, at, at a theory conference and I woke up, it was the morning of my presentation and you know, I, I looked at my phone and I was like, oh my God, YouTube has a new song out, oh my God. And so I, I listened to it on, on repeat and I, I like American Soul. I love the political nature of it. I, I love that YouTube never shies away from political songs. This round was so interesting to me because both songs thematically are very straightforward, right? I mean, Iris is about his mother and American Soul is, well, it's about, extreme nationalism right american soul is songs of songs of experiences bullet the blue sky it's not quite as iconic as bullet but american soul does its job and it does it well it's a brash in your face no holds barred criticism of extreme 
nationalism. And that comes into play, especially using Kendrick Lamar. I love the fact that, that, that U2 brings in arguably the best rapper right now, right? It's a way for this older band to connect to a brand new audience. And it's, of course, a, a political move, and I love it. I usually favor more subtle lyrics, but the message is loud and clear. Iris, it's a touching tribute to Bono's mother. I love Adam's playing. This is a tough one. I initially had it going for Iris, um, and if you ask me tomorrow, I might give it to Iris, but today it, it, it goes 10-9 uh, to American Soul. Wow, okay, interesting. All right, well, let's go ahead and get into round six, Volcano versus Summer of Love. Tim, start us off. Volcano to me, I mean, I like it in some ways, but to me, it's get on your boots, redot. In some ways, I like it, but again, it's just, I don't think that it particularly stands out as a U2 song. Again, to me, not to repeat myself, but I will, it sounds again like something off How to Dismantle an Atomic Bomb, which I didn't particularly like that album. Summer of Love has just got an incredible bass line. I love Bono's lyrics on this. And I think that, interestingly enough, although I think we all liked every breaking wave, I really think that this song is even more sort of West Coasty. To me, what few times I've been to the West Coast out there, this more is evocative of the West Coast to me than even every breaking wave. So I really like Summer of Love. So I gave it to, to that 10 to nine. Fair enough. Chris, how did you have it? Oh man, oh, where to start? Uh, Volcano, I wanted to like Volcano so much, but I, I don't like this song at all. It is my least favorite song on Songs of Innocence. It's such a letdown for me. I mean, the chorus is such a lyrical disappointment. You're living on a piece of ground above a volcano. I mean, Bono, you're so much better as a lyricist, you know? And the line, you and I are, are rock and roll is such a non sequitur. It comes out of nowhere and I get it, I guess, but it was used so much better on that line, you and I are rock and roll, but it was used so much better on in American Soul. Summer of Love, it's much more musically interesting to me than Volcano. And the fact that Summer of Love, it's a political song, again, but it's misleading because it's got a gentle sound, right? It's a down-tempo song. So coming from American Soul, that, that huge contrast in musicality might lead the listener to think, oh, this is not talking about the same thing, but it's talking about the exact same thing from a completely different perspective. And that's why I love it. It's brilliant. This one goes easily to songs of experience. In fact, Songs of Innocence gets knocked down here. 10 8. Whoa. Song. All right. <laughs> you two puts you two on their knee. Let me ask you a real quick question about that. Summer of Love to me sounds a little what's going on ish with that <laughs> kind of, I'll call it a like a over processed cross stick that sound like Marvin Gaye has and what's going on where sure. there's that kind of, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do. I do. I mean, it's not a perfect song by any means. I think it could be better, but. Compared to Volcano, I mean, Volcano for me is not good. <laughs> it's interesting because the CompuBox judges universally disagree with you and Tim. Let's see what Brian has for this round. Brian? Okay, I don't hate Volcano. I did end up agreeing with Chris in the end, and I did give it an 8 for this, so that was also a knockdown for me. I think that... This is because of some elements of Volcano having been recycled in American Soul and American Soul doing so much better that it made Volcano worse in hindsight. I think if American Soul didn't exist and we were doing this, I think Volcano still would have lost, but it would have been a little closer. It almost, this reminds me of uh, when U2 released that medium rare and remastered fan club album and they had Xanax and Wine and all those songs that very clearly became other songs. Like it wasn't it Xanax and Wine eventually became Vertigo or something like, I I don't remember exactly which one it is, but you could hear it. So I I hear Volcano and I just hear an early version of American Soul that's half finished and I I don't really like that. And so that that was why I gave that an eight, but Summer of Love is fantastic. I love the, the more blatant political message there it's almost makes it a modern day sunday bloody sunday for me yeah. but less obvious and more subtle because sunday bloody sunday was always really upfront about it's you know how political it was whereas summer of love kind of hides it a little bit but also the guitar riff that edge has in the very beginning of this song is incredible it's one of his best little guitar riffs ever and i know there's some question as to whether or not it's a youtube riff or it came from one republic or, or ryan tedder more specifically Honestly, I don't care. It's a fantastic riff and it really makes the song and it's it's I really want to learn how to play it on guitar myself, but it's really tough and my fingers don't quite go that way, but one day my goal is to learn how to play that. But all those things together, Summer of Love definitely beats Volcano 10 to 8. One of the things we've learned about a few album fights is that right around round 7, we call it the Burford round, and at least 
in the older sense of albums, the bands kind of get tired and they start to put out stuff that's more closer to filler. So we're hitting the Burford round, but we still have six more rounds to go after it. So this is truly the midway point. So let's get started and go round seven, Raised by Wolves versus Red Flag Day. Jesus Christ, that's a tough one. Let's have Chris start us off. This was a tough one indeed. This is the closest round in my fight. I mean, I, I easily, well, not easily, but I... <laughs> I was tempted to tie it, but I know we don't do that. So I love both these songs. I do it, but Pete doesn't like it. That's right. Then you get called a coward. (laughs) That's right. You know, topically, both of these songs, Raised by Wolves and Red Flag Day, are important songs, right? Because they're they're talking about monumental events. I loved Raised by Wolves when I first heard it. And then I went to the U2 conference last year, and I heard Andy Rowan describing his account of being there the day that that bomb went off and passing around a piece of metal shrapnel. Wow. that he found on the street. Wow. And, you know, like the whole room was in tears and we were just, like, it was an amazing story. You know, it, it was harrowing, it was touching, it was maddening, it was heartbreaking. Um, but this one came down to the music for me. And I love the music in Raised by Wolves, but Red Flag Day, again, what, what, what the band does with the meter and how it links with the lyrics and how they slip into halftime and then they and then they don't and then they go back to regular time the mix in red flag day is also tighter to me something about the mix in the raised by wolf especially in the chorus it sounds a little empty to me so by the slightest of margins 10-9 red flag day there's some realism in raised by wolves like even the registration number of the car is a lyric yeah. and i'm not sure if anybody really ever putting an actual license plate number into a song before but it does add to that visceral thing and it red flag day is i think even it's one of bono's favorite songs so yeah very very close round let's have brian give his round okay raised by wolves is a, is a great song red flag day is a great song this was another one that was really tough for me ultimately what i kind of defaulted to was I felt as though Raised by Wolves was kind of going back to the well again. It was uh, something topic that they've already written about. It was something that they have talked about all throughout their careers and going back to that was, you know, it just kind of seemed like well, you guys probably could have done something different and you could have picked a different thing to write about that you haven't already written about and haven't already talked about ad nauseum for your entire careers. And I think actually Red Flag Day, ironically, it's ironic that they're matched up because that's kind of the song that does that. It does kind of tackle more modern things. It's something new that they haven't done. And also is a new sound too. Kind of like Summer of Love, it has a, a bit of a tone and a sound that they don't typically have on their albums. It also is catchy. I think I can say that about many of the songs on Songs of Experience, that they have a catchiness that sticks in my head in a way that Songs of Innocence does not and any other U2 album does not as well. And it's kind of weird for a song like Red Flag Day to feel so catchy because it's kind of a sneaky song because it sounds upbeat. And the first time I heard it, I paid more just more attention to the music and less to the lyrics. And I was like, hey, this is fun. And then I listened to the lyrics some more and I'm like, this is not so fun. (laughs) uh, I I actually, I like that because it's, it's not what it seems on the surface. And I think it's something that U2 does really, really well is that they have a lot of songs that it may sound like one thing. And if you look at it deeper, it means an entirely different thing. And because of that, I went with Red Flag Day 10 to 9. That sounds great. Tim, how did you have the round? Not to be contrarian, but see, my take is the exact opposite. It's interesting that two reasonably intelligent people, at least I'm talking about myself, you're probably more intelligent, uh, can come to separate, totally separate different decision on this. I think Red Flag Day sounds like stuff they've done before. It sounds like war. It sounds like October. And I find it a bit pretentious for Bono and the Edge to hang out in Marseille or wherever they were hanging out, <laughs> reflecting on the fact that, oh, the Mediterranean also links up with Syria. So we're going to write about Syria like they know a damn thing about Syria. Whereas they know about what happened in the Troubles, all right? And what nobody mentioned, gentlemen, is those incredible backing vocals on Raised by Wolves. I've never heard anything like that. I mean, that was, to me, very, very innovative for you two. And uh, I don't think you're giving them credit for that. So I think that was just amazing. And, and, and yes, they talked about the troubles before, but I think they were more brutally honest about it. I mean, you know, uh, Sunday Bloody Sunday is kind of generic compared to this. Maybe generic is not the right word. Kind of kind of nonspecific, I should say. Generalized. Mm-hmm. This is very specific about things like Pete Tarnett talked about with, 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 the, with the license plate and such. So, I, I, look, they're both good songs. But I think that with the innovative lyrics and the music and Raised by Wolves, I just think it's a better song. So I gave it to that 10 to 9. That sounds great. Well, we're halfway. I'm going to turn this over to our ringside reporter, Mike LaPerry, and see if he's got a question for us. Mike? 
So I'm seeing U2 is a little bruised up by U2 right now, but both fighters still seem to be hanging in there. Based on my quick look at the scorecards halfway through, it looks to me like Experience is off to a bit of a lead over Innocence. In fact, two judges are giving it to Experience halfway through, one judge barely eking out Innocence. So I'm going to start with Chris. What do you think now at the halfway point? How do you think Experience has taken it to Innocence so far? And what does Innocence need to do to come back? Well, my scorecard right now has Experience kind of pulling out ahead of, of Innocence. Innocence needs to come back. You know, they need to gather some moxie here and um, come back soon or else this could get out of hand in a hurry. Brian, same question. What does Innocence need to do now to come back from a deficit here? I feel like Innocence has a little bit of a lull in the middle there, and it's going to need to come back out swinging and really putting as much energy into it as it can, because I think what's really pushing Songs of Experience ahead of Songs of Innocence is that it has an energy to it that Innocence doesn't have, and Innocence is going to fall even further behind if it can't pick up the pace a little bit. Cool. Tim, you are the contrarian here, giving Innocence a very slim one-point lead Ooh. after seven rounds. How is your assessment a little different from the other judges? And what do you think Innocence needs to do to bridge the gap and win the fight? I think the Innocence needs to probably have another Guinness and see if <laughs> the other album is smoking cigarettes and it can pass it. <laughs> Perfect. Well, let's go ahead and get back in it then. Round eight. Cedarwood Road versus The Showman. Little more better. And I'm going to have Brian start us off. Brian? Okay, so I know I've talked a lot about catchy songs and The Showman, Little More Better, does have a, a really catchy chorus with the you look so good, Little More Better. I like that. I have to say, though, that is the only thing I like about that song. The rest of it sounds bland and uninspired to me. Uh, I really appreciate Bono's showman persona that he had on the Experience Innocence tour, and I understand that that persona came out of this this song even before it kind of transitioned into mcfisto later in the show but there's nothing there for me uh, it just is boring and i do not like it whereas cedarwood road that song's fantastic i understand that i'm going to go against what i said last round and that yes they are kind of going back to the well with their their childhood again but this song really does it the edges guitar work his solo in the middle there is is incredible i like the chorus i like the way it's constructed it sounds so good live and it's it really stands out from like their live set and i'm really glad that they brought it back for their last tour too i was really very very happy when i got to see them the one time and i was right up front right up in front of the edge and he was right there when he was doing that amazing guitar solo that may be one of my favorite guitar solos out of him that i've ever heard which is kind of weird because it's so simple but this was my second knockdown round oh. of the the fight here Ooh. cedarwood road defeated the showman 10 to 8 wow tim do you have you two on a knee you know i'm gonna make up for that because mine's the exact opposite i got the showman 10 to 8 on this one. Oh. I, think the, I think the showman is one of their best songs because bono is just so out there with his lyrics he's just like hey this is what i do there's a level of shallow you just can't fake what a great line. The showman gives you front row to his heart, and he prays his heartache will chart. And then what's the other line? I, I got just enough low self-esteem to get me where I want to go. Yes. I mean, that stuff is just, either he's brutally honest or he's brutally making fun of himself. But either way, I just think those lyrics are just top notch. The bass line is great. The acoustic guitar is great. This is one of my favorite U2 songs. Cedarwood Road, yes, I agree. That's a good guitar part in there. Uh, but again, this sounds like something they left off No Line on the Horizon, which I just don't think it's that great a song. That guitar, admittedly good guitar part in Cedarwood Road just can't save that song. And it has just clunky lyrics, symbols, and it's like, oh, let, let's try to be real U2 with our lyrics. Symbols clashing, Bibles smashing. What does that even mean? All right. <laughs> the Showman, again, 10 to 8 on this one. Chris, did Tim get up and go to the bathroom or something? Chris, what do you think about this round? Well, <laughs> I'm a little more in the middle, I guess. Okay. For me, Songs of Innocence bounces back here in round eight. Cedarwood Road, I, I think, is one of the best songs on either album. It is so characteristically U2 in every single way. Listen to the sound of the guitar. No one sounds like that except The Edge. Listen to the lyrics. I think Bible, <laughs> Symbols Crashing, Bible Smashing, that line is U2 in a nutshell. That line right there. It's, it, that's a brilliant rhyme. It's a brilliant lyric. The topic of Songs of, of Innocence was, where did U2 start? And this is about the street that they grew up on. 
I mean, it's perfect. The Showman, I appreciate it. I don't understand all the negativity toward it. For me, it's a moment of levity, a moment of self-deprecation, of honesty on what is a pretty thematically heavy record on Songs of Experience. I'll go so far as to even say that I like the song, but for me, Cedarwood Road is too good. It's too U2 to beat here. Songs of Innocence needed a bounce back in a big way, and they got one. So SOI 10-9 here. This episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at Pete A. Turner or at John LG69 at the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. I don't understand all the negativity toward it. For me, it's a moment of levity, a moment of self-deprecation, of honesty on what is a pretty thematically heavy record on Songs of Experience. I'll go so far as to even say that I like the song, but for me, Cedarwood Road is too good. It's too U2 to beat here. Songs of Innocence needed a bounce back in a big way, and they got one. So SOI 10-9 here. Nice. All right. Well, let's go into round nine. Sleep Like a Baby Tonight versus The Little Things That Give You Away. Tim? Sleep Like a Baby Tonight is sort of deceptively appealing. Uh, you know, it's very, I think, Lennon-esque. I mean, it sounds, he almost sounds like he's singing like John Lennon there toward the beginning. In fact, the whole construction, I think, is sort of Sergeant Pepper-esque. But I was reading some about it, and it's supposedly, some, there, there, there is some interpretation that it's about a pedophile priest who was doing nasty things, but then, you know, could sleep at night about it. So <laughs> that kind of colors it for me, I guess. But uh, the little things that give you away, look, I don't think either one of these songs is that good, but musically, I like the tune. I like the vocals better on that one. So I gave it to little things 10 to nine. Chris, how did you have it? Oh, I could not be more different. This one was a lot closer than I originally anticipated. And I'll get to that in just a second. I like Sleep Like a Baby Tonight. The lyrics and the music, you know, it's a scathing rebuke on the church, and I think it's brilliant. I was a little sad to hear Bono's falsetto because it's not quite as crystal clear as it was early in his career, but the imperfect nature of his falsetto on this song fits the song, so it, it, it works here. But there's no way Sleep Like a Baby Tonight even comes close to Little Things. In my not-so-humble opinion, Little Things is one of U2's top 10 best songs ever in their wow. entire catalog. It is that good. Wow. The song is so wow. interesting lyrically, it's interesting thematically, it's interesting musically, texturally, formally. It's, it's Bono talking to himself, but not old Bono talking to young Bono. It's young Bono talking to old Bono at first. Who does that? Who in their late 50s assumes his 20-year-old self and talks to his old self? No one but Bono does, right? It, it's brilliantly executed. That, that big build at the end when, when, when Bono keeps singing sometimes is arguably U2's best two and a half minutes. If not the best, then it's then it's top three in my book. This is this is an easy 10-8 round for mm. Wow. Holy cow. A knockdown. Holy cow. Brian, how did you have it? Now I swear and promise that Chris <laughs> and I did not talk about this beforehand, <laughs> but I'm gonna say almost exactly the same thing that he said. Sleep like a baby tonight. It's a fine song. I appreciate it thematically. I, I appreciate everything that's there. Uh, if, it, if it wasn't going up against little things that give you away, it, I would have better things to say about it. But in, in the grand scheme, it's an average U2 song. It's fine. I like it. But the little things that give you away really is incredible. And I, going back to what Chris said, it's right from that sometimes part. Like I always felt like the first half of the little things that give you away, it's good. It's not blow you away good. It's like a good solid U2 thing. And then they just get to sometimes I can't believe my existence. And then the edge does that amazing guitar thing that I don't know what in the world that is, but it's incredible. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Larry's got those, the cymbals going in the background. Bono's doing the sometimes over and over and over again. That, like Chris said, like he said it may be the best two and a half minutes of their career. And I can't disagree with that. They just basically took everything that U2 does really well and they smushed it all together into half a song and put it there. And it's just, it's amazing. So that's another knockdown round for me too. That's 10 to eight little things to give you away. Wow. Holy cow. Lots of knockdowns. Okay. Well, let's move into round 10. This is where you can reach me now versus landlady. Chris, start us off. Yeah, this one's pretty close to me. I like and appreciate both of these songs. This is where you can reach me now is perhaps one of the band's most underrated and underappreciated 
recent songs. No one ever talks about this song, but musically, it, it's really good. But let me start with Landlady. I, I absolutely love Bono's tribute to Ali in Landlady. I, I, I love how much Bono loves Ali, and I love how much he is unafraid to profess his love for his wife. Because I'm the same thing. My wife is the best thing about me. And, you know, if I could write a song about her, then I totally would. I think of my own wife whenever I hear Landlady. But this is where You Can Reach Me Now is musically brilliant. I mean, there's a clash between Bono's melody and what the chords do yes. for most of the song. But then that clash is resolved in the bridge. And if you listen to what the theme of the song is, it's basically a song about identity and doing your duty versus doing what you feel is right. And that resolution that happens in the bridge is so subtle, but it is perfect. It, 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 it's a perfectly simple reflection of the defiance portrayed in the lyrics. That's what wins this round for Songs of Innocence, 10-9. Brian, how did you have it? This was pretty close to a tie for me at first, just because I like them both. They're both fine. Uh, I don't feel very strongly one way or the other. I think I just kind of went, the tiebreaker for me was just my enjoyment of the song when I listened to it. Landlady to me is, it's a calm and soothing song. I like the sentiment that's in it. I like some of the musical touches that are in there that you're not going to hear on other U2 songs. I really like the little breakdown at the end, the, the lyrical breakdown that Bono does. It's, it's just more pleasing to me. I like This Is Where You Can Reach Me Now, but it just it doesn't stick out in quite that way. It's, it's a good song, but it doesn't, I'm not going to remember it when I listen to it. I'm like, oh, hey, this is a great song. And then the next couple songs come on and I forget about it and it's gone. But I could also say that about Landlady too, to a certain degree. Neither one of those songs stand out to me. Neither one of them are going to be U2 songs that I reach for again and again in the future. And when I'm listening to these albums again next week or the week after or whenever, I'm not going to be paying all that much attention to them because they're just, they're not there for me. But I did give Landlady that 10 to 9 edge just because of that uh, kind of relaxing, calming uh emotion that I get out of it when I listen to it. Tim? Yeah, neither one of these songs is, you know, Beware the Streets Have No Name or, or God Part Two or, or uh, any of about 50 better U2 songs. Uh, they're okay. Landlady, yes, again, I appreciate the fact that he's a rock star who stays married to the same person and expresses his appreciation for her. That is rather refreshing in the rock field, is it not? And I like lyrics like when I'm losing ground, she gives it back to me. And so it's a nice song. But I do like This Is Where You Can Reach Me Now a bit more. I love the guitar part in that song. What I did like was that sort of Forbidden Planet synthesizer that was snaking its way through there. I could have done without that. I kept waiting for a robot to show up. What's that robot's name in Forbidden Planet? I always forget. I, anyway, I you know, know the one I'm talking about. Yes. He, he was in a lot of other movies, too. But, I mean, there was that weird synthesizer thing, and I'm like, yeah, okay. Um, and, yes, I know it's dedicated to Clash and – and it's trying to be political. And, and, and again, look, I appreciate the fact that bands can be political, but sometimes you try too hard and sometimes you kind of force it in where you don't need it. That said, the guitar part makes this a better song than Landlady. So I gave it to This Is Where You Can Reach Me Now, 10 to 9. Yeah, perfect. Hey, Chris, you had talked about the clash in the song structure. Dr. Tim just mentioned the fact that it was inspired by the clash. Is that purposeful on Bono's part? You know, artist intent is something that I talk about in my classes all the time because, you know, I, 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 I'm teaching my students how to, how to listen and to how to analyze and how to interpret music. So if Bono meant it, awesome. If he didn't, it doesn't really matter because we have made the connection. So, so, the, so the connection is there. If he meant it or not, it doesn't matter. Does not matter. Well, let's find out if things matter here in round 11. The Troubles going back to Ireland again versus The Blackout. And let's have Brian start us off. Brian? I like The Troubles. It has a good groove to it. I like Adam's bass work on it. I don't like the lyrics quite so much. They just kind of seem like something that Bono's done a bunch of times before. But it's a really good song. But it, going up against The Blackout, I, I love The Blackout. I'm a big fan of Ani DeFranco, and she has a, a live album. In, in one of her live albums, I don't remember which one, she talks about how all songs have a moment where they're like a roller coaster and you get up to the top of the, your first hill and it just kind of goes over and it's like a hey there we go moment and where the song you know goes down the hill and it's off to the races the blackout has a fantastic moment like that at the end where all the tension is building up and uh, i kind of i think about it in terms
terms of that really great video that they recorded in Amsterdam mm. for, uh, when they released the song as a single. The part where Bono starts crowd surfing and you know the, it builds up to this big crescendo and the edge and and Adam are doing this I don't know, this really great kind of hard rock groove there and then there's that weird pulsing synthesizer type sound in the background. I don't even know what makes that sound, but. The, the way that that all built built up to it, that was the roller coaster moment in that song, and it executed so perfectly. I love it. This the blackout is is one of my favorite songs on the album, purely from an enjoyment standpoint. I loved hearing it live. I love hearing it on the album. I still love to watch that video for the same reason. So this was an easy one, uh, ten to nine. It wasn't a knockdown though, because the troubles really is a good song. I just think the blackout had so much more going for it. All right, Tim. Troubles has this trouble which is not its fault which is that you remember when it came out they used it as a teaser for that season of the walking dead oh boy back when i was still watching the walking dead and so i'm kind of my, my opinion of it is sort of colored by that which again is unfair to the song but there it is it's a wistful song in fact it's like it, it's depressing to me and who's the gal that sings vocals uh, i cannot pronounce her name likey lee i don't know see i'm so out of touch i don't even know who she is I had to look her up. I mean, but the vocals are really interesting. But again, the lyrics, as, as has been said, not something that have, have, hasn't been done by uh, YouTube before, and it's it's sort of depressing. The blackout is pretty raucous, and it and it rocks pretty well. Again, look, guys, I you seem to love everything that YouTube does political, but sometimes again, it's just forced. I mean, look, does Bono really believe democ- democracy is flat on its back, Jack? Well, give me an effing break. Nothing's flat on its back. I'm pretty sure Trump won the election. It's called the Electoral College. I just get tired of this sometimes, you know? I don't really think he even believes that. I think he thinks he has to say that because that makes him cool as a 58-year-old guy. Mm. 59, I forget. How old am I? I forget. Anyway, oh, that said, Blackout is a better song. At least it makes you, like, kind of your blood uh, get going. The Troubles makes you just want to watch out for a zombie and wonder where Rick is. So I, I gave it to the Blackout 10 to 9. The commercialization doesn't come off good for you. Chris, how about you? Round 11. Yeah, the, the Blackout was the first song I heard from SOE. You know, they, they, they released that video on Facebook. I remember it was, two, it was uh, September of 2017 because it was right around uh, the time Hurricane Irma hit us here in Florida. And I remember loving the song immediately. I, I, I heard Adam's bass line and had so much punch to it, so much funk in it. And then I initially said, wow, this is, this is awesome work by Adam. And the, but then you listen to Edge's guitars, and it's not just one or two sounds. There are several different guitar timbres in there. And, it, I mean, it's, it's classic Edge layering um, texture upon texture. And, again, you know, I, I love that Bono doesn't shy away from being political. And some may call it surface politicism, but if you know anything about U2, they've been doing this their entire career. And so, and you know, of course Bono's going to take shots at 45. The soul, the, the funkiness of the blackout gave me a lot of hope for songs of, songs of experience. With The Troubles, I know we're using a couple of tracks from the deluxe version, but The Troubles, I think, is a great album closer. It, it, it kind of comes from the same vein of down-tempo closers like 40, Love's Blindness, and Cedars of Lebanon. It's a really nice, smooth, down-tempo ending, but to my ears, it just can't beat the blackout. It's it's 10-9 for songs of experience for me. It's interesting, you know, at all the judges in general, there is no consensus round between the CompuBox and the regular judges. There are six judges, and we have not managed to do it. And, and now as we go into the championship rounds here, I do have to account for Songs of Innocence came out originally as an 11-track album, but they put out a bonus that got them to 13. So we are using these bonus tracks to fill out the fight. So though, like Chris said, The Trouble sort of closes out Songs of Innocence, we are using Lucifer's Hands and Crystal Ballroom as the final two rounds against the natural Songs of Experience closers. Love is bigger than anything in its way. And 13, there is a light. So let's go ahead and get into round 12. Lucifer's Hands versus Love is bigger than anything in its way. And if there was ever going to be a unanimous one, I think it's going to be this round. Let's see what you think, Tim. I think I ruined it for you guys. No. Uh, yeah, Lucifer's Hands 10 to 9. Lucifer's oh. Hands is one of my favorite U2 songs. And by the way, can I say something about earlier? <laughs> I don't want to argue with other judges, but of course, that you said, of course, that uh, U2 is going to take a shot, or Bono's going to take a shot at 45. Well, did Bono ever take a shot at 44? You know, it's like... A, some of them it's okay to take shots at and not others. That's what I'm talking about. It's just contrived. It's like when I, my wife and I went to see you two uh, in Cleveland. We drove all the way to Cleveland, Ohio, because she's from up there. We live near Atlanta for the uh, for 2017 for the uh, for the for the for the 30 years um, tour. 
in, of Joshua Tree, and you know, they played the ultraviolet light my way, I believe it was, and clips were all clips of like liberal women. I mean, like you couldn't find a Nikki Haley or a Condi Rice to put in that video, Bono. It's all Hillary and Michelle Obama and stuff. I'm like, come on, give me a break. I get tired of that crap. Anyway, to get back to the point at hand, Lucifer's Hands, I love. It's a great song. I love the lyrics. I love the claps. I love the energy of the song. I know it started, I believe it started out as just like a, a, a guitar a test thing for the edge on stage and they turned it into a song. But it's got a lot of energy. I love the song. Love is bigger than anything in its way. It's anthemic. It is like prototypical U2. I love the song and the verse and the repeating of the verse. And, and, and the vocals are awesome, but I still like Lucifer's Hands better. So I gave this barely to Lucifer's Hands 10 to 9. Chris? I, I like both songs too. I, I like Lucifer's Hands, but Lucifer's Hands to me sounds unfinished, which is probably why it was on the deluxe version and not on mm. the album proper. It's a shame because I, I, I hear tons of potential in Lucifer's hands. The chorus and the bridge, though, are, are missing something. It, it, it feels like there's, there, there are a couple missing musical elements or, or sonic elements that, that, that could have given it a little bit more punch. And mm -hmm. compared to the anthemic nature of Love is Bigger Than Anything It's Way, Lucifer's Hands doesn't, doesn't stand a chance here. It's, it, I mean, it's not perfectly executed, but Love is Bigger Than Anything It's Way is as big as you 2 gets thematically, musically, and sonically, um, you know, the, the love is U2's number one message. And this is, and they're saying it can't be bigger than this. Like literally they're saying that. And then they play music to mm. accompany it. And you know, you can hear it filling 120,000 seats easily. So this one goes 10, nine songs of experience. Yeah, when Bono explores love, he explores it spherically, not linearly. Yeah. And he really, <laughs> He draws in all these different perspectives throughout his career with love. You're right. And truly, love is bigger than anything in its way if we allow it to be. And I, I, I love that message. Brian, how did you have it here to wrap up the penultimate round? All right. I, there's definitely a reason why Lucifer's Hands ended up as a bonus track. Um, I think Tim mentioned that it was a, it started out life as a song that The Edge used on stage. Uh, I actually kind of like it as that instrumental version uh, that happened on the 360 tour a little bit better. I also agree with what Chris said. It sounds unfinished. Um, it just it's a tack on. They just kind of, it sounds like they just had some fun with it, which is great. They should have some fun with it, but it just doesn't land anywhere. It's, it doesn't go in any direction. Whereas love is bigger than anything in its way. I agree with everything that's been said. It's, it's a huge song. It's, it's anthemic. The, the message is so important, um, especially when you kind of couple it with the video that they put out for it. It's, it's really relevant to today's world and something that we all need to really kind of consider. Also, I want to compare it a little bit to 40 too. And, you know, 40, of course, is a U2 classic, but, you know, when one of the, the highlights of the last tour was them finishing the set with this song and hearing everybody leaving and have like out the crowd still chanting, you know, Oh, 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 over and over again. Uh, and you can kind of even hear it echoing as you're leaving the stadium was always so incredible. So this was another knockdown round for me. Mm -hmm. I love us bigger than anything in its way defeated Lucifer's hands 10 to eight. I think though, it's wow. not so much because love is bigger than anything in its way is that much better than Lucifer's hands. I think Lucifer's hands is that much worse than love is bigger than oh. anything in its way. Yeah. I just don't like that song. The 10 point must draws the, uh, the winner up to 10 as opposed to <laughs> yeah. uh, a clear victory. Well, fair enough. Yeah. Let's have the fighters come out and touch gloves before the last round here. All right. Round 13, the crystal ballroom versus 13. There is a light and we're going to have Chris lead us off here at the end. I love the Crystal Ballroom. The band tried to play it a couple times on the In a Sense of Experience tour back in 2015, and it never really, you could tell the band weren't really confident with it, and that translated in, into the into a very lukewarm response from the audience. It, it, it sounded like they weren't confident in the in the live arrangement, and that's too bad because, you know, this studio version, it, it packs so much punch. There, there, there's that funky bass line again, you know, Adam Adam has gotten better with age. He's, he's like a fine wine. He has gotten so much better lately there's kind of a mysterious ways grooviness yeah to go along some pretty cool lyrics i think i appreciate 13 and an argument could be made that the lyrics work better in 13 than in song for someone but for me the punch and the funkiness of crystal ballroom wins it for me so 10 9 songs of innocence perfect tim let's go ahead and have your last round analysis my round 13 crystal ballroom i i tried to like this song i've listened to it a lot uh, but to me i just it was echoes of discotheque. Didn't really get a whole lot out of it. 13 There is a Light is not exactly a stellar performance, no pun intended. 
Uh, it, it has a lot of callbacks to Innocence, but still, I think it's a powerful song in many ways, at least lyrically, although I'm not exactly, again, overly fond of, of the music, of the musical side of that song. So, I, again, neither one of these is really a, a great ending to their respective albums, but I slightly like 13 There's a Light Better, so I gave it to that one 10 to 9. Brian. Go ahead. You're the uh, first time judge here. We let you start it. We're going to let you finish it. Go ahead and close us out, Brian. Okay. I really like the Crystal Ballroom. It's a bonus track, but it doesn't sound like a bonus track. It sounds like it really could belong on the rest of the album. And I'm actually kind of surprised that it wasn't there because it's that strong. 13 is a good song. I'm going to agree with what Chris said, that it it's kind of like Volcano in that it suffers because I actually kind of think Song for Someone does... 13 better than it than you know 13 does it's the lesser version of two songs and if if song for someone didn't exist you know it may come off a little better but the crystal ballroom is it's just so much fun it's great to listen to you know you kind of almost i cannot actually picture there like a crystal ball in the middle of the room when you're listening to it uh, it kind of brings that energy with it so this even though this wasn't a huge victory it still was a very clear winner and the crystal ballroom is uh, the victor 10 to 9 fair enough sounds good and that is our fight so let's go ahead and i want to see if mike has a question let's go ahead and toss it over to mike ringside to see if he's got a question for us mike so judges what do you think the result is gonna be before we tally up well i i think the combined scores are going to be closer than i would have originally given them i mean my scorecard is uh, leans pretty heavily one way but i think um I think the aggregate of our scores will, will bring the albums a little closer, although, although it, it seems to me that Songs of Experience kind of had a run there after the first track and, and, and had um, won several rounds in a row, I think. So um, I think Songs of Experience might pull this out in the end. Okay, Brian. I think Songs of Experience is going to be the clear winner here. It got close a couple times, and I think there may be other judges for whom it's a little closer, but I think across the board we're going to see that the Songs of Experience is the better album and that you too did, in fact, get better with experience. Nice. Tim, you had this fight closer than anyone else, uh, any of the other three judges. Really? Uh, what are your thoughts That's when, uh, well, I, when well, all is would... said and done? What did you learn about these two albums, Tim? Not a lot that I didn't already know. Uh, I, I do like Songs of Experience better, and I think I had it winning by two points. I remember when it came out, I, I, was, I listened to it a lot when it first came out, and even my sons did too. And I said, oh, this is just so much more, in many ways, an upbeat album than Songs of, you know, than Songs of Innocence was. And, but but I, I guess I should say it was surprising to me that it was that close, because I thought that I would, I would have Songs of Experience winning by a lot more than I did. Well, looking in the corners, it looks like Experience is about to raise his gloves, and Innocence is looking a little dejected. Pete, back to you for the final scores. Yeah, that's exactly right, Michael. We've got a unanimous decision. The judges have all the cards tallied, and this fight does, in fact, go to Songs of Experience. Three judges, all three judges having it uh, go that way. The scores are for Chris and Brian. Both had it 126 to 119 for Chris and 126 to 117 for Brian, who had a couple more knockdowns. And then Tim had it. 124 to 122 and as was stated a little closer than the other judges and just for clarity's sake the CompuBox judges brought it in the same direction with only Mike LaPerry being the dissenting judge and taking it the other way which is not a knock on Mike because all three of the CompuBox judges had this thing a one round differential and I think we all can agree there were plenty of tight rounds where it can easily go either way, depending on which knit you pick. A great fight. Let's get Richard's post-fight. Richard, why did this happen? Okay, so a decisive victory, and you heard the reasons why for Songs of Experience. Looking at the pre-fight numbers, it kind of makes sense, and this is a possibility. The four tied rounds just essentially went to Songs of Experience. So making it a nine round to four win, which if you average up the three judges, that's exactly what you get. Nine rounds to four. A little bit more of a blowout than I had predicted. I thought it was going to be around eight to five for the winner. That equals 119 to 125 as far as you go if you average the actual scores. If you add in the unofficial cards, which are like Pete in this case because he's not an actual judge, but he still does score. 
And then any listeners or any friends of the podcast or anybody who wants to score, and we highly recommend anybody out there that's listening, if you'd like to score, but you don't want to necessarily be on mic or, 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 or discuss it, really, it's a good way of getting into scoring and then maybe eventually someday being a judge on the show. Give it a shot. It's a lot of fun. You learn a lot about the music. But unofficial cards made it a little bit closer of a fight, but not, not by a whole lot. It doesn't really change the ratios any. They had it. 728 for Innocence to 747 for Experience, which was a 121 to 125 fight. Just a few extra points for Innocence. Anyway, this is a very interesting fight. Great listening to a bunch of experts talk about this kind of stuff and maybe see and hear things that you never heard before. Very interesting stuff. Congratulations, you two, for beating you two. And back to you guys. Thank you, Richard. As always, very insightful and appreciative. Fellas, I really appreciate it. Any last final thoughts here before we close this thing out? Dr. Tim. Well, I just want to say I think it's amazing, and a couple of you other guys, you guys have alluded to this some, that, that, that a band that's been around for this long could still do as good an album as Songs of Experience because a lot of bands by this point are phoning it in. And you two, uh, if they don't do anything else, yeah, they're real U2-y. Uh, of course, what else would they be? But you can tell they work damn hard on their albums. That's for sure. Dr. Chris, I want to ask you a special question because you're, you're the expert, worldwide expert on U2 in terms of academic credentials. Neither of these albums really smashed and came through. How do they carry an album like Joshua Tree or War or Unforgettable Fire or even Octune Baby? Do they really stand up or is this a band that really has, you know, this is like Tim said, is a well-crafted album. Both of them are, are brilliant in so many ways. Is this just a band that no longer has that extra gear to get songs to elevate into the atmosphere? Well, you know, only time will tell. I was surprised about Songs of Innocence. I really liked Songs of Innocence when it first came out. But I was surprised at how it didn't hold up as well as the years have gone by. Songs of Innocence is going to be five years old coming up in September. Songs of Experience will be two years old. And I think even, you know, with that age disparity, I think Songs of Experience is holding up better over time. I think you two learn some lessons from Songs of Innocence, and you could tell that on Songs of Experience. Experience is not a perfect record, of course, you know, and there hardly are any perfect records, but Songs of Experience, in, in my estimation, is really highly ranked in my own personal catalog. I would probably put it at number three or four. Wow. Um, okay. High praise. Yeah. High praise. It's really, really good, and it, it, it shows no signs. The quality shows no signs of dropping off with age. There's a lot of callbacks to their earlier work. Is this their final original album? No, I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. Brian, what are your thoughts post-fight? Well, I knew going into this that I liked Songs of Experience better than Songs of Innocence, but then when I looked at my scorecard, I was surprised by how much more I liked <laughs> Songs of Experience and Songs of Innocence. I thought it would be a little closer. But this also reminds me, I think in the past like, year or so, after Songs of Experience came out, I've kind of been thinking of or in, considering Songs of, Exp Songs, of, Songs of Innocence and Songs of Experience to, to be two halves of a, of a mm -hmm. double concept album, perhaps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, I would re and I haven't actually done this yet, but, I would, and, but this experience here today really makes me want to take some time to sit down and listen to Songs of Innocence and Songs of Experience back to back as one big double album to see exactly how well they hold up with each other and how well they may complement or enhance each other by considering them to be one big thing. Uh, I think it's a, it's a really natural thing to do because Song for Someone and 13 have really good callbacks to each other and Volcano and American Soul have callbacks to each other. There are similar themes throughout the two. Uh, I think that considering looking at them that way may actually have a greater positive impact on both albums uh, or, or for all I know it could go the other way too and it could be you know not a, not a great experience for me but I think that's gonna be my next thing that I'm gonna do with these two um, inspired by this fight here today is see how well they mesh as one big album well yeah no, I, I think you're right it is a two-part album and maybe even I, I'm when I went through this experience as I judged it I thought I wonder if you could just kind of lay down a chronological map and not every song would fit in there, but there are definitely songs, a lot of songs about about Iris, you know, in general, and just kind of thematically place these things into a, a timeline of Bono and the band's life. And I do mean it in that order and, and what you would get sonically in terms of, you know, because they clearly haven't built it that way. But I bet you could have some pretty interesting musical experiences if someone was to take the time to actually do that. So we do these album fights because we love this music. Obviously, everyone in this fight loves you too. Mike loves them so much. He even showed up just to listen. So we want you guys to support these bands, all of the bands and album fights. 
This isn't meant to be derogatory. It's just a way of comparing and contrasting the work. So celebrate the band, support live music, support these people on their websites, buy their shirts, all those things. This is why we do this, to open people's eyes to music in a new way. We hope that you all enjoy it. Fellas, I get the benefit of hosting these things with my friends, particularly if it's on a Sunday evening, because what's better than that? So I personally thank each of you for doing this with me. I know how much time and effort goes into all of this stuff, and uh, I don't take that lightly. So I really appreciate each and one of you, and uh, I can't wait to do another one. And maybe we'll find another epic YouTube versus YouTube fight. Maybe we'll go old YouTube versus new YouTube at some point. But um, just thank you very much for coming out. Having me, Pete. Glad to be back. 